This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by the Ledger Nano S, the hardware wallet which sets the new standard in security and usability. Get it today at ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code EPICENTER to get 10% off your order. And by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we shall explore the future of naming on the Ethereum blockchain. Specifically, we are talking to Nick Johnson and Alex van der Sande, who are developing the ENS or the Ethereum name system project. The ENS system went live today, so we think it's a, it's a great time to catch up with them. Before we start, let's have a short introduction, starting with Nick. Nick, tell us a bit about your background and how you came to be in the blockchain space. Sure. Uh, so I've been a software engineer for sort of going on 15 years now. Um, I've always been interested in, in infrastructure type projects, the sort of stuff that behind the scenes makes stuff work. Um, I hadn't really had much involvement in blockchains until very recently. Um, when I sort of had chance to cross Ethereum from a, a pure coincidence and, and had a look at it, uh, I'm pretty sure I saw it during the crowd sale, but like many sort of didn't do anything about it. Um, and when I took another look, I was sort of really impressed with, with what was being built up and how rapidly. And since I love infrastructure in general, and, and Ethereum is basically the uh, biggest and most interesting bit of new infrastructure on the internet in a long time, I was really intrigued. Um, and next thing I know, I'm, I'm being offered a, a position by the foundation to, to start working on Go Ethereum and so forth. Um, and from there, it sort of, you know, spiraled from there. Cool. And now, now on to Alex. Now, many of you would know Alex as a UX designer and creator of Mist. But uh, Alex, we'd love to hear from you how you got to be involved with blockchain technology in the first place. Well, I'm I'm, I'm a designer by by formation and by trade, and I've been I, I was working just with the, the developing apps and um, um, like. So I'm trying to be an entrepreneurship for a while, but then I started getting interested in Bitcoin, and then I, I start started getting really interested in in all the, the so-called back then Bitcoin projects, right? And then that's how I got into Ethereum, and it was one of the most active communities, and I just started helping people around. They some uh, back then it was before the crowd sale, and I. A lot of people needed help with presentations and, and designs and, and screenshots, and I started helping them on that. Then when the when the process ended and they had some money to hire people and to to, to ask for help, they they offered me a job, and I think I was among one of the first employee, one of the people to work with a salary to the foundation. One of the first, uh, a few of uh, one of the first hires. I believe. So that's that's how I got involved and I've been working with them since 2014. Cool. Well, when I, uh, I've always wondered um, what 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 it's like for you to be one of these, um, let's say, sole well, well-known people in this space out of Brazil. Like, for example, I'm, I'm originally from India and there are so few people from India in this space that uh, for for my friends and all, what I'm doing is might as well be you know completely bonkers. Right? Uh, what is it like in Brazil? Do you think there's uh, there's a huge community like people understand what you're doing? Your friends understand what you do? Well, when I started, the only places that I could I that wanted to hear anything about Ethereum were in probably like in Bitcoin communities, and they were mostly talking about. Bitcoin price and mining, and then and then sometimes they would oh let's let's give let's give the altcoin the, the altcoin space now, and then I think one of the first talks I gave in Brazil was for for a conference it was so my time slot was just after some guy who was talking about crazy conspiracies on how how everything of the world is going to end and how and, and then and after that there's Bitcoin mining after that there was a short space for altcoins and then the that was me. So in the beginning, Brazilian, the Brazilian Bitcoin community was really just about miner and trading, etc. 
And unfortunately, I think for a long time they, they have to, they are still they are still like that. But I I'm starting to see more interest in the entrepreneurship and especially the social social side. It seems that I've been talking more and more to people involved with NGOs and and who are who want to give to, who are looking on the how it can can help governance and fight corruption, which is a, a big topic on the politics. Brazil right now. Cool. So uh, let's uh, get right into it. Um, as as Mayor mentioned, uh, the ENS or Ethereum naming system went live the day that this is being recorded. So this is going to come out in a few weeks. So by then there will be, I'm sure, lots of domain names that have, that will have been uh, registered. Um, but uh, as of as of now, there uh, there's a Twitter bot, I believe, that's. Uh, uh, that's uh, tweeting out the names that are being bid on, and uh, we were just looking, and it, it seems to be, you know, the 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 live release is, seems to be going smoothly. Uh, I take it. The frugal housewife that if it just went for auction, so don't don't live it. So um, yeah, so before we get into ENS and you know what you know the technical architecture, what what use uh, people will be able to make out of this uh, new uh, system. Uh, first, I think it would be interesting to spend a little bit of time on DNS. Uh, so not the Dogecoin naming system, but the domain name system. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to ask you guys first, so as an introduction, um, can you describe what uh, the domain name system is and what role it plays in the functioning of the internet? Sure. Um, so I think it probably helps to go back to, to how it originated. And, and back in the very early days of the internet, when it was still called the ARPANET, um, early 80s, uh, there was no real domain name service. And the way you assigned a name to a computer was you literally called them up on the phone during business hours and you said, I would like this name to be associated with this IP address. And they edited a great big a text file called hosts.txt, the, the remnants of which you can still see on your computer today, and, and added the name in there. And then they sent that via FTP uh, to every single person on the internet, basically. And if you wanted to visit a new site, you had to wait until the newest version of the hosts file was distributed uh, and make sure you got a copy before you could actually actually do it. A visit a site is a terrible term, of course, since this is pre-web, but at any rate... Um, and, and this became sort of rapidly uh, unwieldy as the number of hosts and the number of names ballooned. Um, so uh, some of the, the early uh, sort of pioneers came together and um, Paul Mokopetris, who's one of the, the founders of, of the domain name system, in fact wrote the effective first version of it, um, set out to, to build a distributed system. Um, and what he built is what eventually has become DNS today. And the way it works is it's actually one of the internet's first distributed systems. We we think about blockchains and so on as being this you know revolution in distributed systems, but to some degree uh, the DNS was kind of the first. And um, the way it works is is you have these these root servers and they're responsible for for answering queries about the the first part of the name, so or actually the last part, the way it's normally written, so dot com and dot net and dot org, and they when asked how do I resolve .com gets sent to the servers responsible for .com and those then get asked about the next bit example, for example, and then they send it to the next bit and so on. And the so the idea is that anyone wanting to register a new name can can add it to the domain name system at, at the relevant part by, by asking the people who maintain that section of it to add them and then point to their own domain name server which does the next bit and so forth. I had no idea that host.txt was the original sort of domain name system. Yep. Uh, I had no idea. That's that's really cool. It used to be literally all the was. Wow. So you would just populate that with all the domain names and then you had this company that would issue sort of iterative versions of this host.txt file uh, until it just got unmanageable. Yep, exactly. Okay. So so essentially there are these servers and these servers are sort of the top level domain name servers. So you've got like .com, .org, like dot paris you know all these new domain names that have come out and when you query um when you when you make a request your isp uh through its dns servers will query the correct uh 
I guess, root server for that uh, top level domain or TLD. And then that TLD server will come back with a response saying this domain name points to this IP address. And then you can then make that request. So before you make any, you know, when you type facebook.com or whatever, before you go to Facebook or, or get anything from Facebook, you're first contacting a DNS server a directory essentially to get uh, the IP address for, for Facebook servers. Yes. So there's actually uh, one level above even the, the .com and .net and .org ones called the GTLD servers, and they just maintain a list of addresses. So you only need the one GTLD server, and that says that tells you where to find the .com server and the .net server and the .org server and so forth. Okay. So as new domain, as new top level domain names uh, start, you know, uh, appearing. Much as uh, such has been the case uh, these last few years, with uh, I think there's like a thousand now. Um, your your ISP or DNS provider, typically it's your ISP, will give you access to this list of of top level domain servers. Uh, so no. the GTLD. No, the, the so the GTLD is actually maintained by ICANN, um, so that your oh, ISP okay. doesn't need to update with each uh, with each new top level domain. I see what you're saying. Okay, okay, so that's that, that's quite clear. Um, so talk about how the how the DNS system and with regards to ICANN and h- how that works, or what you know, what is the governance model there? Like, if me or some company or anyone wants to register a new top level domain, let, let's say I want to register like a you know dot epicenter uh, top level domain um, how does that work what's the governance me- mechanism in order for that to happen etc so so like you pointed out it used to be that the answer was you don't uh, you you either put up with dot com dot net and dot org uh, or you form a new country and and if you're lucky mm-hmm. and you form a new country then you'll you'll get you know dot epicenter so if you can you know form form the epicenter country then you're sorted um, that changed a few years back when um, I can decided to open up registrations for new TLDs, and of course now we have an incredible profusion of them. And the way that works is uh, they opened up a, a limited period during which people could submit proposals for new TLDs. Uh, and if you were interested, then you wrote up a many, many page document describing what the TLD was and what you intended to do with it and how you'd sell names to people and so forth. Um, and a whole lot of other details like security aspects and so on. And then you submitted that along with a $100,000 uh, application fee, which is uh, void if rejected, uh, to ICANN. And then they went through all of the lists and assessed all of them and determined uh, who got names and who didn't according to the applications. Uh, and if you were lucky enough to get it, then you now owned exclusively the the registry for that top level domain, and you could decide according to whatever rules you'd set uh, who gets subdomains and how much they pay for them. So that that opportunity window to register new top level domains has now expired. That that's not no longer possible. To yes. Do that. Okay. So they they're talking about opening it up again for a second batch of new domains. Um, they they might revise the rules from what they've learned the first time around. They might, in fact, almost certainly will increase the application fee. Um, and then, yeah, they go through another period of accepting applications and then close it down and then review them all and so on and so forth. Why is it so expensive to register a new top-level domain? That's a very good question. Um, my guess is a combination of the, the amount of due diligence they have to do and, and not wanting to be out of pocket for that and a deliberate tactic to uh, erect a barrier of entry so that, uh, you know, Joe Bloggs doesn't say, I want dot Joe Bloggs unless he's really serious about it. Right. Well, I mean, there could be sort of, sort of some sort of an auction system, you know. That yeah, that, discourage that people. Seems like it would work pretty well. I thought I can have a monopoly, uh, an effective monopoly on the on, on the main system, so they they sort of can charge whatever they want. And are there any ways that, in your opinion, this system is vulnerable, or has have there been any? Well, I mean, I know I'm asking this question, but I, I know that there have been attacks on DNS uh, in the past. What are some what are some of the ways in which the system is made vulnerable, either security vulnerabilities or any any type of vulnerability? So I, I guess you can you can roughly divide it up into security and social issues or technical and social issues. Uh, from a technical point of view, DNS was designed back before things like SSL even existed. 
um, everything was in the clear on the internet and, and the general sort of threat model in the very early internet was uh, only people we trust even have internet connections. And obviously that's changed, but the internet infrastructure has been slow to catch up. So DNS continues to be resolved entirely in the clear, and yet it's surprisingly easy in some situations for people to mess with your DNS replies. Uh, if you're surfing the net at Starbucks on an open access point, then chances are that uh, anyone who's in the same cafe as you can can screw with your replies and send you to, to different sites. So DNS and, requests are not secure through HTTPS or some sort of a secured um, like... Exactly. And they're also... Uh, so they don't have the transport layer security like that. They don't even have... They also don't have um, any sort of... Uh, security to attest to the origin of the record. So even if you knew your connection was right, you wouldn't know if the DNS server was lying to you or not. And there are solutions to this. The, the uh, accepted solution is DNSSEC, which is a sort of a certificate hierarchy similar to how uh, SSL works for, for websites um, and for other resources. Um, so it relies on you know the root the root certificates being inviolate, and they issue signing authority to .com and .net and .org and .babies and so forth, um, and they sign certificates for for all the individual domains. Um, but it's being it's slow to be rolled out. It has a, a lot of technical issues, both in terms of implementation and 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 sort of uh, legacy software, uh, and there are political issues too, believe it or not, um, because there's a whole bunch of attacks that. Are possible, for instance, if you if you can just lie about whether a name even exists, um, but proving that a name doesn't exist exposes some information about what names do exist, and some people don't want other people knowing what names exist, and so on and so forth. Also, the, the, there are some some other issues in which uh, I can have effective control over the name. So, if if you are doing something that is illegal under the jurisdiction that I can is your domain might be taken taken away from you, even if what you're doing is perfectly legal in your own country. And also that I, I would say this opens up the possibility of of fire of government firewall blocking a specific whole domains from, from existing or just switching them out. So I think I so I, I think that's a, that's a big political vulnerability there. It almost seems like the DNS is, can be like a potential choke point in what is otherwise a de otherwise a spread out and decentralized information. Very, very much so, unfortunately. Uh, a number of countries' uh, sort of censorship systems, ranging from the, the fairly liberal, you know, that, that some, some countries have unfortunately adopted all the way down to very restrictive uh, ones like Turkey and so forth, have... Uh, relied at least historically and sometimes still on um, uh, on being able to um, uh, redirect DNS queries and and sense the results. Let's take a break to talk about the Ledger Nano S, the new flagship hardware wallet by Ledger. I'll pass it over to Ledger CTO Nicola Baca, who can tell you all about Ledger's security features and SDK. The Ledger Nano S is a personal security device based on a secure element, a screen and button so that you can verify everything that is done on device and make sure that you are really doing what you want it to do. Compared to our previous solution, this device is based on the latest generation secure element, the ST31 from STMicro. The ST31 is, an, is using a secure ARM core, which means that you can have the same ease of development that you would have on a generic uh, microcontroller, but benefit from the security features of a secure element. Security features uh, include an application firewall at the lowest levels that let you protect applications from each other, which means that you can load multiple applications on the hardware wallet, even post-issuance. And you as a developer will be able to leverage these features to load your own application without our authorization and without any kind of authorization from the vendor. We will be providing this device with an open SDK um, that lets you do anything you want with this device. We provide sample applications for cryptocurrencies, different cryptocurrencies, so Bitcoin, Ethereum. Uh, uh, we will also provide a FIDO authenticator, and you will be free to add everything you like. For example, you could add some secure messaging, some encrypted chat, and you'll see that the solution is quite powerful and very easy to develop with. The Nano S sets the new standard in hardware wallet security and usability. You can get yours today at ledgerwallet.com. And when you do, 
be sure to use the offer code EPICENTER to get 10% off your first order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of EPICENTER. Let's segue into ENS, the Ethereum name system, starting with like, what is ENS and what is it trying to do? In short, ENS is, is our attempt to bring naming to Ethereum um, and, and blockchains in general, I guess. But, but for now, let's you know, stick with Ethereum, solve one enormous problem at a time. Um, the, the idea is that uh, you know, block, blockchains, first in the form of Bitcoin and then in the form of, of other blockchains, have been around for a while. But people still communicate uh, addresses to each other as if it was 1984 and hosts.txt was all the rage, or in fact, even before that. Uh, so if you want to send some funds to somebody, you have to get their, uh, you know, their Ethereum address off them or their Bitcoin address or whatever. And it's a big, long, you know, uh, string that's completely unhuman readable and very easy to typo with terrible consequences if you do. Um, and while it's difficult to build a distributed naming system on top of a first generation chain like Bitcoin, um, Ethereum actually makes this really easy. It's it's really straightforward to build a naming system. Um in terms of technical implementation. Uh, and there have been attempts in the past, but they haven't really uh, attempted to address the full set of use cases that uh, a naming system can engage in. So the, the goal of goal of EGNS is effectively just to go from human readable names like uh, you know Ethereum.eth or wallets.eth or whatever to uh, various different types of resources. Uh, the, the most common ones being somebody's wallet address or a contract that you want to interact with or a site hosted on Swarm um, and, and uh, IPFS, uh, things such as that. Interesting enough, I think uh, it's, it's interesting to know that the, this whole this whole issue sort of predates Ethereum for uh, for a bit, right? So one of the first use cases of of, of blockchain other than the coins was probably Namecoin, as far as I remember, which was clearly an attempt of on building a decentralized naming system. Um, and sort of Namecoin didn't really, wasn't really successful at that. And then, then, and then when, when other blockchain, when other people try to make other uses of blockchain, they, when, when, that's when sort of colored coin and master coin sort of started sprouting up. I think, I would say that was sort of the beginning of Ethereum because then a lot of users sort of realized, look, why, why do we have to have a separate blockchain for naming and a separate blockchain for, for keeping track of assets and a separate asset and a separate blockchain for some kinds of uh, financial transactions? Ideally, there should be one single blockchain that allows smart contracts. So in a sense, trying to build name, decentralized naming systems predates Ethereum and help, I would say, help launch the whole platform. Cool. So uh, one question that comes to my mind is um, we've we've had Namecoin, right, which was based on like a Bitcoin like like architecture where there's like in inputs and outputs to a transaction. And then on, on, on top of Bitcoin, one, one of the famous projects that uh, was trying to do naming of, some, of another type was the one name project. Right. So. So, like, tell us. How Ethereum offers something different compared to compared to these these systems. So so on Ethereum you have ENS and then on on a Bitcoin like architecture you had Namecoin and one name. When you go from like that, those architectures to Ethereum, what kind of capability opens up? So so I think um, probably one of the main points is that those other systems have started off by trying to. Uh, solve the naming problem for the whole world. Um, they've affected, they're, they're trying to build a, a replacement for DNS right off the bat. They're trying to resolve internet domain names and so forth. Um, and while that's something that I look forward to, to seeing with ENS, our initial goal is to solve naming for Ethereum. Um, so we're not going up against the, the entire mass of the entire legacy internet. We're attempting to make Ethereum easier to use and easier to interact with and other related resources like Swarm and IPFS easier to interact with. Um, and then, you know, once we've, once we've fixed that, as if that's not a big enough problem, uh, we can try and tackle the entire internet. 
Yeah, and I think the, the whole interoperability of Ethereum is also a great way in, in how it works better in Ethereum because for us, it's not... Because once you are, you are using one blockchain, once you're using an app that can connect to Ethereum, if, if you want to send a token, if you want to send an Ether, if you want to interact with, a, with let's say, a crowd sale contract, you can use ENS directly from it. So it... The more the more apps we have in the ecosystem, the more they, they will be able to use the tool itself. So I think that's they, they sort of feed in each each other. So speaking of apps, I mean, when you think about it, perhaps it's not obvious to everyone, to everyone but a, a DNS system uh, is really a, a, um, a way of improving user experience. It's 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 taking, you know, uh, addresses that are not friendly, human friendly, human readable, and, and making them human friendly and human readable. Um, so from that perspective, I think that uh, it's, um, it's, an in, it's an interesting way to perhaps, you know, in, in, in one sense, in, you know, make user adoption a bit better uh, or, or help, help user adoption. Um, through improving the user experience, like you know, we had Status on uh, recently. You know, they're doing something else in the in in that realm, and it seems that this, although it's perhaps not obvious, you know, when you look at it, it because it's a sort of technical thing, uh, it is a, a user experience play in, in a sense. Um, and so, I'd I'd like to ask you then, as a follow up, is as a developer, how will I integrate uh, this into my into my DApps, and how will it change the experience for my users? Okay, can I answer first the, the, the user perspective? Because I think that helps the developer side. So we are building this, which is an Ethereum browser that allows you to, to, to load applications. Um, just by developing this, we, we have two main problems that we, we've been able to notice. First of all, is just sending names around, right? As Nick has, has spoken before, just in order to send a transaction to anyone, you have to have their 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 Ethereum address, which you I mean it's it's not human readable. I can I cannot tell you over the phone what my what my Ethereum address is. I have to copy paste it, and of course you can add a, a typo there. So right right there is a problem. And we we want our users to be able to type if they want to let's say make a donation to Epicenter. To Epicenter TV, they should be able to just send a, go into their wallet and type Epicenter, and they would be able to know that okay, that's their correct address. And the second thing is that this is also a browser, and is and is we are implementing Swarm for it, which allows you to, to connect to a site that is not hosted hosted anywhere. It, it's actually you just you're downloading it from a peer to peer network. And it's great because you are you can be sure that you are always downloading the you, instead of typing an address or a, either an IP address that tells you where something is, a hash describes you describes you what exactly you are trying to download. So instead of having an IP address, what you have is sort of a hash that describes really a version of an application which contains the files, which or all the assets you need. But of course, then we got we have the same problem that IP addresses had in the beginning, and the same problem we have with an Ethereum address, which is in order for you to connect to a to an app, you need to type a hash, which is which are sixty four characters in which you cannot mistake a single any any one of them. And then that's another problem that we need we need a DNS to solve it. So right now, you, and then you'll be able to say. Look, I want you to, or users to download the Epicenter, to go to the Epicenter app to interact with us. So you could just type epicenter.if on, on your Myth browser, and it will download either from Swarm or from, from IDFS. Just turns out that also this, this kind of problem that we are having with Myth is the kind of problem that everyone has, right? So Status IM has the same issues by sending the sending each around. And MetaMask has have the same issues. Everyone has the same issues. So by by solving it on a global scale, it's it, any anyone any developer can just plug ENS into it and help solve it in the in their app. And then so from a developer's perspective, you know, 
if I if I make the the comparison to a browser, uh, the browser calls up you know a, D, a DNS server, and then that gets the information from the server for you know from the the, the corresponding uh, IP address uh, and domain name. As an app developer, I like plug in the DNS smart contract and call up that smart contract to get the corresponding domain or yeah domain name and and ether address. If your app interacts with the blockchain, uh, you can ask it to, to you have any information about an app, right? So you, you have a name and it's epicenter.if. And you can request them anything that you want in the sense that, look, I want, I, what do you want from it? I want uh, uh, an Ethereum address so I can send funds. I'm a wallet. Okay, here's, here's, the, here's what you have. Oh no, I'm a Bitcoin wallet and I want, what is the Bitcoin address for epicenter.if? Here, here you are. You can you can query that particular resolver. Oh no, I want. I, I'm looking for a hash of a content, or maybe an IP address, or something like that. Then you just query the smart contract, and it will be able to tell you any sort of information that is attached to that particular name. And actually, um, recently, uh, in one of the token sales, there was this uh, token sale for this project called Token Card, right? And uh, a very interesting incident happened. I I'm sure the two of you know that incident. That there was this person who was trying to send like 250 ether to the um, to the smart contract, the token sale contract. And uh, this guy was uh, this guy had the wallet like my ether wallet loaded up on his screen, and he was searching for the address to which he ought to send that money to. And in order to get that address, what he did was he went to the Slack of um, this token card project, and he browsed through the Slack and he saw a message where uh, where it seemed like one of the administrators of that Slack had put in uh, the address to which the funds ought to be sent to. He took that address, sent it to that particular address, he sent 250 ether, and then I think like 30 minutes later he realized that he had been scammed because on the Slack, that particular message wasn't put by the admin, uh, but was rather put by some kind of attacker, for lack of a better word. And uh, he ended up sending all those 250 Ether to this other address and basically lost that money. And like when I was reading that thing, I was like, okay, we do need human readable names for smart contracts, right? So so that you know in the in future token sales i can just i can just say okay i want to send to the cosmos token sale i can just type like cosmos token sale and send the money and be sure it's safe something like that i, I think that's a, a good example yeah um, although a note of caution of course is that anyone can buy a name so anyone could yeah. could have bought that but a, a properly handled token sale of course would buy the name ahead of time and they would declare this is the name that the contract will be available on when it's ready and that gives you the advantage that you can you can spread that information far and wide ahead of time. And then when there's a rush, you don't have to wait for, you know, somebody who looks legit, but as you point out, turns out they weren't, to uh, to post a, a mysterious address that everyone just takes on faith. Yeah, I would say that ENS uh, solves part of the problem, and I would say that the clients themselves should try to solve the second part, which is to check that ENS can tell you. Who, who, what is the address related to that name, right? But if, let's say if you if you if you have a typo on your name, of, or if you if you're having if you bought if you're typing a similarly sounding name, probably in your your wallet it should have some sort of check saying, look, this is actually a name that you sent money to before, right? So it's it's another way in which you, you can you can I, I would say that. We always need to be building more and more protections to the user on top of it because we, we cannot never under, underestimate the kinds of issues that the user can users will find themselves. Yeah, and and I think uh, the 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 other thing that that's that looks interesting to about ENS to me is, and this really falls out of the nature of the Ethereum platform is, so we are like we started off the show with DNS and like comparing it to ENS. And when I look at DNS, as far as I'm aware, it's it's an it's it's a system that maps like human readable names like Amazon.com to IP addresses, right? But and you can say that ENS is like sort of a better version of DNS, 
or decentralized version of DNS eventually. But but in reality, like what ENS is doing is something that probably even DNS doesn't because uh, like a smart contract is essentially like an execution of a program, right? Like mm -hmm. this is this, this program and there's this execution of program and ENS maps names to executions of programs, like not just IP address, but names to executions of programs and maybe even names to previous versions of a particular website, right? So if you map an ENS name to an IPFS address, then uh, maybe every new version of that website gets a slightly different name and you can actually map names to different versions of websites as well, right? So it, it, it seems to me like a system that has the potential to offer much bigger capabilities down the line than uh, much much bigger uh, UX advantages down the line than the DNS system itself. You're, uh, you're exactly right to point out uh, versioning. Um, there's already a uh, package management system being built for Solidity, uh, Ethereum's main programming language that relies on this uh, in ENS. So it uses ENS to register package names and allows you to register different versions against different names. Uh, likewise, there's people working on a, a decentralized version of Git, which um, uses ENS to register the uh, the heads, you know, the, the tags and branches of, of Git. So yeah, it's a perfect example of, of where it extends beyond regular DNS. Also, I would say that the, just the fact that one big difference is that ENS itself is a digital property, right? When you own a domain, what you actually own, you're just owning a promise that there is someone who holds your domain for you, that will keep your domain for you, and you charge your credit card for it. You cannot actually do something with your domain. So we, we are talking about, just for instance, token sales, right? You, you're talking about uh, raising money into a token sale. Right now, the token sale just goes into a Moodistic account, and then that Moodistic account just is, is controlled by, by, by users, by, by, by the founders. In theory, what you could have is that you could have a contract that con controls also the ENS domain for the claim. So let's say that you, you want to run uh, Epicenter crowd sale, right? And you could make so that you could make a contract that controls epicenter.if. And then if, if, if let's say, if your, your, your crowd sale token are not happy with, with yourself, they could own the, the domain and take it elsewhere. Or you could get that domain and, and loan it to someone or put it as a collateral of a loan. You could, you could have a sale for, for, let's say, oh, I, I want to raise 10,000, I want to get 10,000, borrow $10,000. And if I don't pay this back by the end of the month, then you have to you get to control my name for let's say twenty four hours, and you can like post it on social media or something like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm a terrible player. I I, I never pay my my deal. Or you can use the deposit that was used to register the name itself as a collateral as well. Exactly. It's like the name itself becomes a smart asset, right? Yes. So. We might, we might think of a DNS name as still like sort of a dumb asset that you can do very limited things with, but like ENS names could be you know smart, smart asset. So I think these things, these things like seem non-obvious, but I think they are, they'll be very they could be very important uh, down the line. So uh, with that, like let's let's kind of walk down into the technical architecture of of ENS. Um, so ex explain to us like how how it works, how how the system works from 10,000 feet up. So I, I sort of described earlier how DNS works uh, in terms of you, you have your root servers and they redirect to the next ones and so on and so forth. Um, ENS attempts to retain that uh, sort of uh, abstraction and the, the diffusion of responsibility such that you can you can delegate ownership to, to other parties at different levels of the domain um, tree without some of its advantages of that system In if you applied it to Ethereum. Um, so, so if we if we went directly with mirroring DNS onto ENS, then if you wanted to resolve, uh, you know, uh, foo dot bar dot baz dot blah dot ENS, you would have to do a whole series of lookups, and that would either be, depending on whether you're doing it on chain or off, uh, expensive in terms of gas or slow in terms of real time. Um, and if you're doing it on chain, of course, you you have very little opportunity to cache any of that, so you incur that cost every time. So the ENS structure is a little different. It has a, a single central contract called the registry, 
um, and the registry maintains a, a tree of every single name in the ENS system. But it's a very sort of bare bones tree. Uh, the only thing it knows about each uh, name, so by, by name I mean uh, .eth and then foo.eth and then bar.foo.eth and so on, is uh, who owns it, um, and that's the person who has permission to, to make changes, uh, and what the resolver is for it. Um, and then the resolver is another contract that can be, you know, anyone can write a resolver, anyone can deploy a resolver, and if you know, own a name, you can point at that resolver. And the resolver's job is to actually do the lookups. Um, so every uh, every name lookup in the ENS system is, is a two-step thing, uh, a two-step process. First, you uh, ask the central registry which resolver is responsible for epicenter.eth, and it returns an address. And then the software asks that address uh, what is the, you know, the, the Ethereum wallet address or what is the swarm hash or, or whatnot of epicenter.eth to answer the query. So the advantage of this is that everything only ever requires two steps, but you get the same uh, decentralized nature, you get the same um, uh, distribution of authority and distribution of implementation, so people can implement their own resolvers, they can add new features without having to centrally coordinate it, uh, that you get from a system like DNS. Okay, so I, I basically, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to imagine this as this giant list of, uh, what, like name and the resolver at which you have to query in order to figure out what that name leads to. Yes, exactly. That's so, so that is the registry and it's, it's, it's like this, this giant list and that is, that list is what, uh, is, is the key component of what you have built and in order to figure out what that name exactly leads to, anybody could write their own resolvers as smart contracts. So maybe those resolvers could also reside on systems other than Ethereum. Uh, well, yes and no. They they need to exist as Ethereum smart contracts in order to call them. So the the sort of the two components are the the actual implementation of the registry, the big list, and the interface that registrar uh, sorry that uh, resolvers have to to obey. So they do need to exist as Ethereum smart contracts, um, but they can get their data from anywhere. So you can write a resolver that, that uh, updates its data from uh, any sort of resource you want. Um, you know, for, for off-chain, it can be uh, signed, it could be a multi-sig, it can be, um, you know, as Alex was suggesting, you could have something where it's owned by a token contract and so forth. So this, this sort of starts to be like, the registry itself is like very dumb, and then all of the smartness like, like that we are talking about that on an ENS, a, a name can be loaned, it can be part of financial transaction. All these smartness arises because you can make smart resolvers do different things. Yes, and, and not just smart resolvers, you can also have smart owners. So uh, the owner of a name can be just a, an external account. You know, I can own a name myself, but if I want, I can make a contract that owns a name. And when the contract owns a name, it gets to set the rules for how the resolver is updated or what subdomains it creates and so on and so forth. So that's actually uh, how registrars work on ENS. All they are is they're a contract that owns a name and they set the rules for uh, when they will hand out subdomains and who they'll give them to. That's, that's really amazing. So I think, yeah, for me, like this kind of thing kind of demonstrates the power of Ethereum, right? Like you have something that is absurdly dumb, which is just like a list of, okay, like here's a name and he, here's a contract, go to that contract to figure out what this name is, right? It's, 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 it's an absurdly dumb list, but, but like it's like you can build all of these smart things on the edges and like slowly as people build smart things on the edges, you, um, you, you keep getting all sorts of emergent behavior that, uh, um, that, is, that is unexpected. So like before we kind of, go down into technical details tell us some of these emergent behaviors that can that sort of happen when like programs own names or the resolvers are smart in some way so the um i mean i think the the first ones that occurred to us were the the, the possibility of registrars like i mentioned so the you know dot eth is owned by a contract and because that contract owns a name it's a registrar and we can set arbitrarily complex rules for how it hands things out. So we use an auction-based system on the mainnet, but on the testnet deployment, we use a first-in, first-served type system that uh, gives you any name you ask for but expires them after 28 days. 
Um, if you want to buy wallets.eth, um, then you can set up your own wallets.eth registrar, which can then hand out names according to your own set of rules, which might be free to everyone, or they might have to pay you a deposit, or you know, pay you an outright fee, or any number of things. Um, and you know, the, the what makes a registrar is effectively just what the interface is. So, if you have a multi-sig that owns a name, is that a registrar? I don't know. You know, it's, it's just a bunch of people deciding to do stuff. Um, if you think back about the early days of the the um, the DNS system where you had to call them up during working hours to ask for a new name. Was that a registrar? I suppose it was. It was a person whose job was to update names. Um, in, in terms of the resolver end of things, where the sort of smartness comes in there is, I guess it's twofold. One is that um, the set of resources that you can resolve, so, uh, you know, swarm hashes and Ethereum addresses and IPFS addresses and so on and so forth uh, depends only on the resolver, not on the uh, the registry. The registry knows nothing about resource types. So if you come up with a new resource type that you want to be able to resolve, say you decide that uh, you know that the latest topness is is you know a new token registry or something, uh, you can write up a short spec saying this is the interface that resolvers must implement to, in order to to be able to resolve this. And then anyone can invent a new resolver and, and deploy it, and the ENS system instantly supports this new uh, new type of information without any sort of the only coordination you need is making sure other people know that they can do it as well. Um, and I guess the final bit is that you can um, you can add smartness to the, the resolvers in other ways. Uh, for instance, uh, you know we know Raiden is coming soon. There's no built-in support in Ethereum for Raiden. But it doesn't really need it because you can write a resolver that's Raiden compatible and is capable of, of taking updates and uh, you know from uh, Raiden channels, and then now your name supports Raiden because your resolver does, and that didn't require any central coordination or or hard forks or upgrades or anything. I, I think I, I think it's important to note that I, I think there's two two things that Nick said it bears repeating because. So first of all, let's say that Whisper is a protocol, right? Maybe your Whisper ID might be another one, or someone can can come up with another P2P protocol that you can control, that you can connect to, that it requires some sort of other sort of connection. You can add that to your ENS. That means that let's say that you are building a chat application on Ethereum. You can have the same name that you use on ENS. You can use it as your chat interface. So if someone builds Twitter on Ethereum, they can. You already have your your username. That means that if you bought Epicenter that if at some point you will be Epicenter that if you will be you own the name Epicenter on every single app that connects to ENS for their own protocol. And I think that's important because then your name belongs to the user. Doesn't Your name doesn't necessarily belong to the social media platform or whatever platform you're using right now. I think that's important. Let's take a short break to talk about Jax. Jax is your wallet, your complete user interface to cover all your blockchain needs. I've been using it and I've been loving it. Now, Jax supports a lot of different cryptocurrencies. I suppose Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, Ethereum Classic, Zcash, Augur Rep, and they're adding many more, keep responding to users' needs. Now, with Jax, the nice thing is that you can manage all of those coins within a single wallet and you are in control of your own private keys, they're not on their server. And there's a single 12 word seed that you can use to back up your wallet, all your coins and sync them across different devices. Talking about devices, they're on pretty much any device that you can think of. You can get it on PC, Mac, Linux, you can get it on smartphones like Android and Apple and iPhone, you can get it on tablets or even, there are even browser extensions for Chrome and Firefox. And on top of that, in JAX, you can actually exchange different cryptocurrencies for each other because they've integrated a shapeshift. And more partnerships and integrations are coming down the line in 2017 that are going to make JAX even better. So JAX is really making blockchain and cryptocurrencies accessible for the masses, easy to use for the masses. Make sure, sure to get your own JAX wallet at JAX.io or you can get it from any of the app stores you are using. We'd like to thank Jax for their support of Epicenter. You guys are essentially running a you're running a resolver and a registrar. So the registrar is the part that allows people to register the domain name. So 
Um, right now it's at registrar.ens.domains. And not a good domain, by the way. And, and you're also going to be running the resolver that is going to be returning um, the corresponding smart contract address or you know, wallet address for any domain name that somebody, uh, yeah, for any domain name that someone queries. So uh, I, I guess uh, we, we wrote and deployed the, the registry, but the, when somebody registers a name, we deploy a sort of a default resolver for them, but they can, if they choose, deploy their own, uh, you know, their own version of resolver and so Okay. And so then let's say I register wallets.eth and, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a nice guy, so I'm, I'm letting people register domain names for free, like subdomains of wallets.eth, so I can have like nick.wallets.eth, I can have meher.wallets.eth, and I then essentially run a resolver. Uh, so when people query that top, well, that, yeah, that wallet.eth domain name, um, then I'm providing the subdomain, uh, the corresponding uh, addresses for the subdomain. So it's, it's sort of cascading. You have like resolvers over resolvers over, over resolvers. I think that's very important because uh, one of the issues is how, how do you select a name, right? So... Right now, in order to own a name, it takes about five days in complete, right? From the moment you want, you say you want to own a name, then there's three days where anyone can also claim the same name and bid for it. And then there are two days in which you can review your bids. And so you cannot get a name faster than five days by the time. But for some cases, you what you really want, you don't, you don't want any bids, you don't want any... So it requires five days and at least two or three transactions, different transactions for you to complete a name purchase. But for most cases, what you want, you just want a user to click one button and own a name immediately. So if you own, let's say, wallet of, wallets of if you could give you give away subdomains for your own users, and then I can I can be Alex at wallets of if or 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 Nick dot wallets of if. And it could work sort of like an email address, right? So okay. you are Alex at Ethereum.if as yeah. it, right? Okay. And what what would present anyone from uh, so you're sort of establishing yourself as the dot ETH top level domain? What would prevent anyone else from you know to, you know just forking your project and and, and having a competing uh, top level domain that can, that is conflicting with your namespace? So the short version is network effect. Um, the, the way that somebody uh, starts resolving things on the, um, on the ENS system is that they get the address of the registry, that sort of central tree, big list of domains. Um, and once they've got that, they can look up every other name under it. They can look up all the um, registrars and so forth. If somebody wanted to establish their own alternate hierarchy of ENS, they could absolutely do that. They just deploy their own um, registry. They, they set up their own registrars if they want to hand out names under whatever role they want. But uh, the, the same thing happens on DNS. There are you know alternate DNS registries, uh, but they suffer from the network effect in that unless somebody knows to use your uh, version of the registry as the you know the authoritative one, they're not going to actually uh, be able to look up the names that you registered. So one of the things that we, we also have to consider is that in order... So you mentioned registrar.ens.domains, right? You mentioned that as if it's the, the place where you can buy uh, a name. So that's not necessarily true in the sense that... I mean, we've built an app where you can register a name, particularly on... on registrar.ems.domains, but, but the magic of Ethereum is that anyone can deploy their own app to register domains there, and actually they have. So my Ether wallet have deployed their own, their, have deployed their own register app. Ether, my Ether scan has deployed their own ENS connect, connection, uh, ENS port. And I think that connects to the reason on why I think it's hard for for. And uh, where it becomes interesting, because the process of, of doing ENS mean, meant that we connected, we contacted my Ether wallet, connected Ether scan, we connected the guys from Parity, we connect, connect, contacted the guys from from MetaMask, and everyone sort of and status I am, and everyone agreed and wanted to get support for ENS. So I think that's what you need to have if you want anyone could deploy their own ENS system. But, I mean, they would have to have all this client support in the end. 
Right. Okay. So the network effect is, is really important. So, you know, in, in a sense, a competing top level domain might be hard. It might be hard to like you know, move you out of that, that dominant position. Uh, but someone could register or could decide to, to do like a dot Ethereum or I don't know, like a dot DAP or, or something like that. And, uh, and, and make that available for any wallet provider to, 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 to query that resolver and, um, you know, they could have their own registration service and whatnot. I'd like then to talk about the, the, the auction system that uh, you've, uh, uh, you've put in place in order to register domains. Can you explain how that works? Yeah, of course. So the way we are doing it, it works. It's what, so we, we, we went through many iterations with the community, you know, go, going back and forth, giving ideas and people coming back to us. And the way we are working it right now is what it's called the Vicry option, right? So what we want is that there is no rush. There is no, you don't need to be there first. We, d we really didn't want to have a, to create a land rush where everyone, whoever, was the first to register something, we just immediately get it, right? So that's why we sort of created this, this thing that takes necessarily five days total. So the way it works is that you put it, you put a single bid for how much you value a domain, right? So if you, if let's say you see a domain and say, I, I would pay a thousand dollars for it, right? I would pay 10 eaters in order to be able to own that domain. You put uh, so you put a few few bid. No one can know how much you put. No one can know which domain you're trying to try to win. And then you put a, that few bid. There's this period of three days in which anyone who can see that that domain is open for bid and they can also put bids down. After those three days, there are we you know, there are two days in which people can reveal those bids. And then at the end, what happens is the person who wanted who valued their name the most? So that means that first, if you if you if you value it a thousand dollars, you will win the name. You will only pay what is necessary for the second highest price. So basically, you only pay what is necessary for you to overbid the second highest person. So if you, you were willing to pay a thousand dollars, if someone someone offer a hundred dollars, then you only need to pay. You only need to deposit a hundred dollars. Okay, so it, I mean, sort of similar to like an eBay auction, I guess, uh, in in a sense. So once once I've registered that domain name, uh, and it's it's mine, and let's let's say I win that auction, how long do I have that domain name for? Because with DNS, you know, typically you um, you register a domain name for a year, uh, and then after you have to pay for it again. So how does that work with uh, ENS? So right now, what you're doing is that you're not paying to anyone; you're just locking that net, that that iter amount of iter for one year, right? So 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 you just you're just locking that uh, that amount for the for one year or for how long you want to keep that domain. And right now we have deployed a, uh, a temporary register, and the idea is that we want to see how people act, how people react, how people buy domains, how how people try to squat on the domain names. And after the after one or two years, we intend to deploy a new, more permanent register. And the, the main difference will be that currently, right now, all you need to do is that right now there is no sort of registration fee. You don't need to have a recurrent fee that you keep, need to keep, keep buying. What do you on but on the more permanent register? There will probably be some 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 way that there will be a recurring some sort of fee that you need to pay just to prove that you are alive and you are not actually just caught in the name, right? So how that how is that going to work? We don't know, but we are we know that. I think I think Nick will have some, something to say here. Uh, so I was just going to say that the um, I guess the root insight that Alex is getting at is we realize that it's not really practical to design an entirely new system uh, for for allocating and managing names entirely from scratch when very few people are involved so far. So in some ways we're following a sort of a startup methodology of the, the minimum viable product. So we've launched a registrar that is, is capable of uh, allocating names using a fair auction system um, of, of allowing you to use those to interact with ENS. But the it's not the permanent governance system. The goal is that we'll use the first couple of years experience uh, uh, to uh, build uh, expertise both with ourselves and with others uh, in the community um, to raise awareness about the you know and raise the profile of, of ENS 
um, and then to, together with the rest of the community, design and build a permanent registrar that, uh, you know, that, that we believe will function well for the environment it lives in. So the registrar you see today is, is the interim one and, and implements uh, what's necessary to sort of bootstrap things and get them off the ground. Okay, so this this auction system currently it's 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 an auction system where you bid on a domain um, when once um, that the, the the sort of auction period has expired uh, the the highest bidder gets the domain name and that money is locked for for a year uh, and at that point then sort of auctions I presume would start again and that whole process would um would would start once again a year later uh not quite so so your name your deposit is locked for at least a year um and that's to prevent people from sort of bidding on something and immediately giving it up and getting it back um after a year you can if you want relinquish the name and get the deposit back but if you want to keep using the name um you can do that you you just leave the deposit where it is and you can continue using the name um, okay. And the name is yours effectively until the permanent registrar rolls out, at which point how it works is up to the what the community decides the permanent registrar should do. Okay. So I see perhaps a problem there where you know, if, I, if I'm locking, let, let's say I, I put in, I don't know, like five ETH right now, right, for a domain, and that's worth like, okay, $500 at around $500 at today's price. In a year from now, if, if Ether is worth $1,000, know, all, all of a sudden... I'm no longer locking five hundred dollars, but I'm I'm locking five thousand um, dollars. Whereas the you know the value of that domain name has not gone up you know tenfold. Um, the money that I'm effectively locking in uh, is now worth ten times as much. Uh, is is there any way that you plan to mitigate that? Can I you know review my sort of bid uh, at that at, at the end of that year period? We considered proposals like that uh, when we were initially building the registrar. Um, and one of the problems is that it, it introduces both complexities and, and opportunities to game the system. You, you can't hold another auction for the name unless you're willing to take the risk that the name gets taken off the person who originally registered it. And, and we put a very high value on uh, stability of names, on, on the idea that once you've registered a name, uh, it should take some fairly extraordinary circumstances for it to no longer be yours. Um, so it's, it's difficult to sort of impartially assess, you know, what the deposit should be now, what the name is worth now, without either introducing, uh, you know, game theory problems or without introducing um, opportunities to exploit it or just a significant additional complexity. So when you're bidding on a name today, you should be doing so in the knowledge that you're going to have to tie up the, the deposit for at least a year, no matter how much uh, Ether, you know, moons. Um, and that when that time comes up, you're going to have to make the decision of, of which is more valuable to you, uh, being guaranteed to retain the name or uh, the, depo the deposit money. Um, and if you want to take the risk, you could relinquish the name and get your deposit back and then immediately start a new auction. But you're doing that in the knowledge that uh, somebody else might decide that it's more valuable to them than it was to you. Let's now move on to one of the final topics for, for this show, which is... so. You the core thing that you're building is a registry that tracks .ens names, right? Names that end with .ens. Tell us about the governance of the .eth uh, registry. So uh, in, in the short term, um, it's it's entirely automated. So the interim registrar has, has rules for auctions, allocating names. It has no disputes process. It has no way to, to revoke you know, legitimate names. Um, once you've got a name, you have it for the duration of the interim registry. Uh, in the long run, um, you know, the, the governance is something that will evolve with the community and, and whatever we deploy for, deploy for the permanent registry, we'll, we'll decide what that looks like. And I, I really hope that some of the people listening will get involved in the discussions about how that should look, because I think we, both Alex and I, although we have slightly differing views on how the permanent um, governance should work, um, both want lots of input from, from both from the outside and, and just to learn how it functions in the interim. Um, I also get the sense you might be asking about the, the root and the multi-sig, is that right? Yeah. So the, the other component to, to ENS governance is, is at a level above the .eth, uh, the .eth registry, 
um, and that's the root. So like we talked about earlier in DNS, how there is a um, there are root name servers that, that are responsible for telling your, your name server where to find .com, .net, and .org. There is a root node in ENS, which is the, the sort of the empty name. Um, and that is the record, the node that is allowed to create new top-level domains and reassign registrars for top-level domains and so forth. Um, and so, of course, there's a problem of, of how do you govern that fairly. Um, and uh, again, in the sort of a minimum viable product uh, line, we're, at the moment what we're doing is we have a multi-sig that is owned by uh, seven individuals in the Ethereum community. Um, and they together have to sign, you know, four out of seven majority is necessary in order to uh, make any changes to the root of ENS. Um, and everyone who signed up agreed to a very sort of uh, specific and fairly restrictive agreement on what circumstances that would, would happen in, uh, which is effectively um, in, in case of, of you know, mitigating an impending disaster, in the case of technical upgrades like replacing the interim registrar with a permanent one, um, or in the case of you know, uh, other changes to the system that the community as a whole uh, you know, is, is in consensus on and the, the individual key holders feel is, is not an appallingly terrible idea. Uh, you can see the the exact list of of you know what the keyholders agreed to on on ENS domains. Um, in the long run, we would like to see the multi sig based governance replaced with something um, you know something uh, more distributed, which might be some form of DAO that is capable of of you know taking votes from from um, uh, stakeholders in the system and so on, but. I think designing that governance system, um, especially since I think we both believe it should have a, a significant bias in favour of stability, um, is going to be, I think, at least as big a challenge as designing the, the .eth permanent registrar. Um, so in the in the short term, we, we've handed it over to these key holders in order to sort of secure it and, and make sure that things uh, you know, don't go horribly wrong in the short term. Okay. So the the long what what's the do you have like a roadmap that you've uh, sort of set out to you know have a a governance system by you know this this time or this time frame? So the the roadmap for for dot eth is basically a year from now start soliciting submissions and working on design for a permanent registrar with a goal of rolling that out two years from now. Uh, we haven't set an explicit timeline for replacing the multi sig because I think we'd like to see how things work out with the .eth governance first. Um, but I think the goal is that we could start working on that in terms of a, a permanent thing, more or less as soon as we're, we're happy with .eth. And I think uh, what will inform us a lot there is other attempts at DAOs, uh, things like Colony and so forth, and how well they function and, and where their strengths and weaknesses lie um, to help us build something permanent for the root. Also, it's interesting to note the limitations of the current multi-sig holders, right? Because they they have the control to upgrade the, the the DNS, but they do not have controls or any access of any of the funds that are locked into the into the DNS system. So, if if they for the worst thing they could do is that to, to create a new sort of DNS that would not that would not assign names into a way that other people would like to. And um, what what that means is that everyone could just migrate to a new ENS system that used the use the, the previous previous version and and get all their their ether holdings back. After a year, they'd be able, able to get their ether back. Yes. Okay. So if for some reason, like Vlad and you know, new Nick and uh, and uh, Juan and uh, maybe like Aaron Fisher decides that they want if they change the current rules if they deploy a new contract. You can immediately take your ether back, right? Yes, if you, you can, so, yes. Okay. And if, if they don't change anything, and then after a year, you want you, you decide that that holding that name is not worth for you, you can release back the name to the wild, and then and then get your ether back. Okay, because I was kind of, I was kind of concerned about this four of seven multi sig, although. You know, it, it sort of makes sense to you know look at the community and respected people in the community to um, hold you know the, have this responsibility. At the same time, it's sort of a homogeneous bunch of people that you know it, the, the, the 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 risk of collusion is quite is quite high if you 
if you think about it, a better, more heter uh, heterogeneous option would be like to take people that you know are from different communities or perhaps even different uh, you know types of open source projects or people people that are not even involved with um, with uh, you know with, with the blockchain space. Um, but you know, it's sort of reassuring to know that at least there are some safeguards there that would prevent them from taking funds, uh, from uh, specifically taking funds, uh, and that if anything like that were to happen, not that it's likely, uh, you know, uh, uh, domain name holders would be able to get their, their funds back at the end. Exactly. Should ENS collapse uh, under some sort of, you know, massive collusion between like Vlad and Nick and, and Juan? <laughs> um, <laughs> The you know the fund fund hold, funding uh, members would be uh, reimbursed. I think there's a there's a definite mm, sort of network effect going on there too, which is that uh, you know we selected the people we did because we we knew and trusted them, and the people we know and trust uh, also tend to be part of the same community. Um, and also, we need them to have some level of awareness. We we don't need them to have a detailed technical understanding of how the system works, but they need to have at least a basic level of of awareness of the system and its constraints uh, in order to act in an informed way because we really don't want a rubber stamp bureaucracy. We want the key holders to actually uh, listen to our arguments about why a change should be made and, and make up their own minds. So uh, before we wrap up, um, tell us where can people find you? How can people get involved? Uh, is there any, you know, are, are, you, are you looking for people to join the project? Uh, this is your chance to call out to the community. Great. Um, so you can you can find us uh, if you want information uh, on ens.domains. Uh, if you want to join in the, the conversation in the community uh, on Gitter, we're in the Ethereum slash name dash registry channel. Um, and yes, we are absolutely looking for people to contribute. Um, read up the documentation, uh, have a chat with us, come up with new ideas, uh, submit EIPs, sorry, EIPs. Um, and, and yeah, please do get involved because the system's going to be uh, the more successful, the more people build on top of it and the more people uh, improve on it. All right, cool. And we'll add uh, those links to the show notes. Uh, so anybody who's interested can uh, you know, look up the, the, the registrar, try to register a domain or um, uh, join the community on Gitter. So thanks a lot, guys, for joining us today uh, on Epicenter. It was a pleasure uh, speaking with you and learning about ENS. My pleasure. Thank, thank you for inviting us. And thank you for our listeners for tuning in. Epicenter is part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find this show and lots of other great shows at letstalkbitcoin.com. Of course, if you like the show, uh, there's lots of different ways you can support us. Of course, you can tell all your friends about it. You know, you can just go like, just go tell all your friends that Epicenter is great and you love it and you learn things every week and that will make us happy. Uh, you can also leave us an iTunes review that helps people find the show. And uh, you can also leave us a tip and the tipping address is in the show description. So thank you so much for tuning in and we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.